Here is Ted Clark, who is relaxing after one of the roughest jobs there is. He is a member of Wisconsin's Forest Firefighting Organization, one of several hundred emergency fire wardens we have in our state. Ted's a businessman who lives in a typical little town in the north central part of Wisconsin. It's a pretty place with its wide shaded streets, a good place to live, and a good place to visit. It lies in a forested area that normally attracts a big tourist trade. Some people come to fish. A lot of them come just to relax and to enjoy the scenery. Ted Clark is a contented man who wouldn't change places with anyone, for his is a rich heritage. A heritage he can pass on to his son, the right to live. And a great part of his contentment rests in knowing that in his capacity as an emergency fire warden, he is playing a vital role in helping to conserve and protect this land he grew up in. But Ted's a businessman too. When times are good, his service station makes him a pretty fair living. However, when his area was plagued by fires, it hit him right in his wallet. He found, for instance, that customers were unable to meet their current bills or buy more merchandise. And the fires which hurt their economy also ravaged the forest areas, destroyed the soil. made it subject to erosion and water runoff. Roaring, raging crown fires which consume and destroy life, property, and thousands of acres of forest lands are still an ever-present threat. All forests are susceptible to such fires at times when the woodlands are very dry and particularly the many pine plantations that are springing up all over the state must be closely watched and guarded against this threat. Though not as spectacular, but just as damaging, surface fires are common to mixed hardwood stands and are very destructive to both trees and cover. New growth is destroyed, wiping out the cycle of natural reproduction. Hunting success is reduced. Removal of the cooling shade makes streams too warm to support trout. Larger trees, at first glance not harmed, get fire scarred or injured to where insect or plant parasites extend the damage to ruin much valuable timber. Tourist trade comes to a standstill the recreation business suffers, for no one is attracted to an area scarred and blackened by flames. The story of her forests is to a large extent the story of Wisconsin. At one time, except for more open lands scattered to the south, this sort of cover prevailed throughout the state. Then, with a whoop and a holler and the ringing of axe blades, began a 50-year logging spree at that time common on the North American continent.
In all fairness to the loggers, they were following a familiar pattern of the times. Everyone thought that the resources of this wondrous new country were inexhaustible. Trees toppled, fortunes grew in the face of the relentless and tireless onslaught on our forests. Cutting was wasteful and ruthless, and there was a public indifference to forest fires. Debris was allowed to pile up, and forest fires became a commonplace follow-up to logging operations. It was not until the Peshtigo Holocaust of 1871, which took the lives of 1,500 people, as well as other great damaging forest conflagrations, that the seriousness of the situation was brought forcibly to the attention of the people of Wisconsin. These tragic fires helped bring about early efforts in forestry legislation in an attempt to further stimulate public interest and action. Some money was appropriated for fire protection, but it was a case of too little and too late. Early firefighting efforts were sincere and enthusiastic, but ineffectual. Fire continued to run rampant. Ted Clark had many things to take into consideration when he decided to accept the appointment as an emergency fire warden from a district ranger. He knew that he was taking on a tremendous responsibility, that the work would not be easy. The district ranger knew that in Ted, he had a man who had the qualities of leadership which the job of emergency fire warden required. Since 1927, Wisconsin has maintained an organized system for preventing, detecting, and suppressing fires on the forest and wild lands throughout the state. The state is divided into 18 districts, each one supervised by a district forest ranger. Forest rangers are on 24-hour call throughout the year. Much of their work is administrative determining the causes of certain fires, the damage they inflicted, how the fire control effort can be strengthened and improved. Or you'll find them in the field, laying out trails or fire lanes, building and maintaining communication systems, or making other improvements in the forest protection setup. And one of the most important of the forest ranger's many duties is to train his emergency fire wardens, men like Ted Clark, preparing them for the job ahead. Knowing how to properly and safely use standard firefighting tools is important because in many instances, the emergency wardens and their crews may be the first to reach a fire because they are closest to it and must battle it out until the ranger arrives with his crew and specialized firefighting equipment. Though manpower and handwork are still used constantly, new techniques and mechanized equipment have made firefighting far more efficient. One of the most important factors in fire suppression work 
is quick, immediate initial attack. Improved roads and transportation get men, equipment, and supplies to the scene without delay. Water is still one of the most effective weapons against the forest fire. And these trucks are all equipped with pumps. Streams of water quickly knock down the flames and quench the burning embers. Tractors draw the fire line plows. They're also equipped with pumps. Where heavy equipment cannot be used, crews supplied with hand tools must do the job. Here, firefighting must literally be done by the sweat of the brow. Back-breaking work that may require thousands of man-hours before the fire is dead out. But before a fire can be fought, it must be discovered and then accurately located. In the scores of fire towers strategically placed throughout our forest and wildland areas, tower men keep a continuous lookout during many months of the year, are always on the alert. A telltale wisp of smoke is sighted through the Allidade. And immediately the degree reading is given to headquarters and other towers. Nearby towermen take their fix on the same smoke. And cross-checking on a map quickly and positively establishes the location of the fire. Portable radios enable field crews to keep in contact with the tower, headquarters, and each other. Wisconsin was the first state to use aircraft in forest fire control work. As early as 1915, pioneers were experimenting with the use of a plane to spot and combat fires. Today's pilot is able to keep in constant touch with the ground crews and together they're able to hit them hard and fast. Planes are often used to speedily deliver additional firefighting equipment and supplies. Sometimes even more men or trained specialists to the scene of the fire saving hours, perhaps days, of time and acres of valuable timberland. The best way to cope with the forest fire problem is to do everything possible to keep fires from starting. One of the forest ranger's main jobs is to teach fire prevention. Before a fire will burn, there must be three elements present in the right combination fuel, air, and heat. Remove any one of these three and your fire goes out. Take away fuel, the fire goes out. Without oxygen, the fire dies. The basic thing to remember is to remove any one or more of these three elements. No air, no fire. Take away heat, the fire goes out. And we can do something about man-made heat. The public must be made to realize its responsibility in the fire prevention program. Posters are attractive and effective reminders.
These posters have helped make Smokey the Bear the most beloved and best known symbol of fire prevention. Here's a fellow who's captured the fancy and imagination of young and old alike. Torchy timber lost's baleful smirk symbolizes the evil effects of fire. As a result of these campaigns, the public has heard and seen more about forest fire prevention than ever before. And the campaign has been stimulated through our growing awareness that none of our natural resources is inexhaustible, our forests least of all. Every available medium is being employed to reach the individual, to point out the value of our forest areas, and to make him aware that he personally can be an important factor in helping to prevent forest fires. For man is directly responsible for 98% of them. Lightning or other natural causes accounts for about 3% of our fires. Logging operations, once a major factor, now account for 1%. Abandoned campfires, a shining example of man's carelessness, still cause 4% of the fires. Debris burning and the carelessness that is often associated with it is responsible for 24% of all fires. Approximately 24% of the fires are started by miscellaneous causes, perhaps children playing with matches. Railroad operations and other activities still cause 15% of the forest fires, in spite of the advent of the diesel engine and a special fire prevention and inspection program. The careless smoker, year after year, continues to be one of the main offenders. He is directly responsible or accountable for about 29% of the fires which start. More and more people are seeking the recreation and beauty our forests offer them. Better roads, better transportation, more leisure time. But their inadvertent thanks is to destroy the very sanctuary they've sought out. The burning of refuse and debris is a fire control activity in his community which Ted Clark, as emergency fire warden, is especially useful in supervising. His big job is the issuing of burning permits. The emergency fire warden has complete authority in his district to determine whether or not a burning permit will be issued. This farmer has a good record and gets the permit. It shows the time and place the burning will occur. The information is passed on to the towerman. He spots the smoke and reports its location. This is checked on the permit list at the ranger station. All the towerman has to do now is to keep an eye on this particular smoke. Most such burning is done in the spring after the snow has disappeared. But burning permits are issued throughout the season, unless the hazard gets high and burning would be unsafe, until the ground is again snow covered. Through the efforts of our emergency fire wardens and our regular ranger force, Cooperation of landowners and other residents or users of the state forest areas on prevention measures has steadily reduced our fire losses from those of years ago. There are some people, however, who choose to ignore those state laws that require burning permits, who burn carelessly.
There is no permit for a fire in that particular area. The forest protection men swing into immediate action. No chances can be taken. Every smoke that cannot be accounted for must be investigated. The location is phoned to Ted Clark. Ted has work to do, and now. He quickly calls together the crew of local men he has organized to fight forest fires. For the time being, Ted Clark and the crew he has collected and trained for just such emergencies is our first line of defense. Here is where their training pays off. Each man knows what he is supposed to do. You might call Ted and his crew shock troops who go to work on the points of greatest danger on the fire until professional firefighters with their heavy duty equipment can get there and take over. at the state's ranger stations are on an around-the-clock alert for such emergencies. Equipment is kept in readiness. As is always the case, when this alarm came in, no time was lost in getting into action. But even with the best equipment and top trained men, there are still brutal hours ahead, for a forest fire is relentless and stubborn. And it's Ted Clark and men like him, our emergency fire wardens, who have for years played a very important part in the state's program to protect its forest areas from fire. Well, this one's out, but there will be others to fight. Most of the fires in our forests are totally unnecessary, are caused by sheer carelessness. Ted Clark, dedicated citizen to his community's welfare, visualizes what the forests mean to the state's economy and everybody's well-being. The planning and building for future generations. Some of the most wonderful scenery in the entire country. to the families who live in the security of their woodland homes. Busy, prosperous people amid their wealth of natural resources. The state's record is good. 
And because of the efforts of our emergency fire warden force, men like Ted Clark, it is getting better and can still be improved with the help and understanding of all her citizens.